Greetings, everyone. Thank you for showing up today. We're going to take just a moment to allow uh, our last stragglers to arrive in the meeting. We'll be starting shortly. Greetings, everyone. My name is Tim Rayburn, and welcome to uh, Team Leadership for Beginners. And I appreciate everybody taking some time out of your day to join us, and I hope that we're going to learn some cool new things today. Um, I'm going to change my background because I have the wrong background up. There we go. Okay. So uh, just a little bit about me as we get started to ground. Um, my name is, as I said, Tim Rayburn. I'm a vice president of consulting with Improving. And uh, just to give some, some background, I have been a Microsoft MVP uh, for 11 times across my career. I'm an author of a technology book uh, co-authored with uh, Devlin Lyles. Uh, I'm a speaker at many, many things. I'm a geek on all, all sorts of stuff, including barbecue, which I am wildly passionate about. And, uh, and I'm, I care a little bit about how leaders work within organizations, which is sort of why we're starting here. And one of the focuses I've had, uh, wanted to have on this talk is specifically talking about team leadership, not to talk about leadership in the broad, I'm the CEO of a massive company. I mean, the, there's leadership at that level is also supremely important, but I think very often there's a Im important transition as you're coming up and saying, this is my my team and we're trying to get some very, very direct work done. And I am still have my foot in the trenches. You know, I'm still writing code or still uh, still working as a scrum master or still working as a product owner. But I, I'm really much very, very much sort of first time on the line of stepping into that role. And what does that mean? So today we're going to start with an, a fairly simple agenda. We're going to try to define leadership, which is remarkably hard. Um, then we're going to talk about trust and building trust, because I think you'll find as we define leadership that that is going to be a very important thing. And then we're going to talk a little bit about putting this into practice and some concrete uh, examples. And we're going to sort of role play through some examples of we have this problem, how, how do I work my way through this? So uh, as we go through to today, at several points, you're going to see, uh, well, it went the right way, Tim. You're gonna see that little icon appear in the upper corner of my slides. That is your opportunity to, uh, to mentally make the jump and say, hey, if I have a question, now is the time to go to the Q&A feature inside of this presentation and type in your question there. Shortly after each of these slides, there will be an opportunity uh, where we will arrive at a point where uh, Michael Slater, my very competent producer behind the scenes, will be giving voice to your questions onto the stream so that I can then answer them. Uh, but when you see these, that's the time to start typing because I still have a little bit of time until I get to that questions point. So you'll have time to get it entered, for Michael to read it, sort of prioritize what he's going to ask and how he's going to ask, 
and we'll then answer them shortly thereafter. So watch for those little flags as we go, go on throughout the day. So let's talk about defining leadership. I have a quote on my business card from one of the most amazing human beings that has ever lived, much less also happens to have been one hell of a programmer and a pioneer in our field of software development. And that is Rear Admiral Grace Hopper. Grace is amazing. The, the, the Admiral has is responsible for so much of what has gone on in early computing. Uh, and so she was the first female flag officer for the United States Navy. Navy. Um, but on top of that, she also coined the term debugging when she pulled a moth out of a Harvard Mark II computer and uh, reported it as a bug. Uh, so the, uh, but the quote that is on my business card, the quote that is relevant to our topic today, so I don't just spend 15 minutes gushing about uh, uh, Grace, is uh, to the quote, you manage things, you lead people. This, this to me speaks to my heart of where we want to approach as we lean into things. Now, part of that is just because of the fact that management has a, has a bad connotation, and it has a bad connotation for all sorts of reasons. If you look up the dictionary definition for it, this is the dictionary definition of management the process of dealing with or controlling things or people. Okay, that's fine. The dictionary can say what, it's, what it is, but just for the purposes of our conversation today, we're going to accept that we don't want to manage people, right? So we're gonna side with Grace on this and just stri strike that last portion. I know very few people who want to be dealt with and even fewer who want to be controlled. Um, also, I love the archaic definition of management, which is trickery and deceit. Um, that's, that's just, it speaks to all these negative connotations we have to referring to, uh, referring to the process of management. I always find it interesting when, uh, when lines get drawn and people start talking about things. They almost never, when people are mad, talk about, well, the leaders in my company are X, Y, and Z. If they want to talk bad about a company, it's management. That is the word they run to. It is uh, how the bulk of organized labor refers to the, the, uh, the management of their company, and it is management and labor, right? Uh, we want to come in and say, hold on, this definition, like nobody, if you're living into this definition, if you're being, if you're dealing with people, if you're controlling people, that's not what I'm looking for in leadership and definitely misses the mark. So I agree with Grace. We don't want to manage people. The leadership uh, dictionary definition is included because of the, how remarkably unhelpful it is. The action of leading a group of people or an organization. Okay, that doesn't really tell me how to live into leadership. So as we go through this though, I want to remind everybody that if you're in a leadership position, if you're a team lead, if you're a manager, if you're a director, if you're a vice president, if you're a president, if you're a CEO, this statement that has been said many times is unfortunately remarkably true. People join companies because they get excited about the vision of that company, about what they plan to execute, about how they're going to go about and change the world with that company and how they're going to make things better. That missional approach is the reason why people uh, join companies. People leave managers. They don't leave companies. It is very unlikely that the company has changed its mission or its objectives so fundamentally in the time that you've been there that you are no longer excited by that concept. What you're unexcited about is doing that alongside the people that you are managing you inside that organization. So when I've given this talk before in presentations and things like that, 
I've asked in a more interactive forum where it's, I actually have an audience, what are words that describe great leaders? Um, these are some of the ones I've heard and others that I've found online that describe what it is to be a great leader. Wonderful things on here like principled, loyal, upbeat, positive, and op optimistic. Um, the one that is directly above my head and on purpose, by the way, directly above my head here, trusting. The, I, I think that trust is one of those truly powerful words that speaks to us about how it both speaks to a willingness to relinquish control from the leader and the belief by the leader in someone else that they're extending trust to them and that that trust is empowering and it allows them to truly make a uh, make a feeling in those who they are working with that they do believe that they are competent people who are capable of doing their job the other big one i want to bring up on this list and it Again, it's present in many of these words, but it's also present explicitly as the word is accountable. The, the point there, ethical and accountable. The getting accountability right, as we will discuss here in a moment, is is the in many ways the silver bullet of trying to to become a leader inside of an organization. You are trying to to continue to be a positive force in the lives of your coworkers, while also making sure that we all remain accountable for what's going on. Now, nowhere on here was the, can I explain DDD better than anybody else? And nowhere on here is, oh, that person is the best at XYZ that has ever existed. And likewise, nowhere on here is, this person knows more math than I do. Now, I have worked for, for leaders in organizations that all of these were true for, but they're not the defining point that makes them a leader. And that's going to be relevant here in a moment as we get into our next section and we start talking through the journey of becoming a leader and about building trust with teams. But before we get to that, we're gonna define trust but let's pause a moment and see if we have any questions that have been asked. Hey, Tim, I have one exciting question for you. All right. Brian would like to know some cool examples of nerd or sci-fi leaders. <laughs> some cool examples of nerd or sci-fi leaders. Um, sure. The, the, I think that if you look at, for instance, Almost anyone who has ever sat the captain's chair of the Star Trek Enterprise would be a great example, but I'll choose, choose Picard for lots, uh, not only because he's currently had his own series, but also because of the fact that uh, Patrick Stewart is just the bomb. And so the, a, an example of someone who regularly was willing to extend trust into his team, turn over to them, and empower them to do things while still making sure that it was accountable. He didn't have to check back five times to make sure that Jordy had everything running in engineering. He just let Jordy know what he needed and trusted that that was going to occur. So that'd be one off the top of my head. Is that all our questions? That's all we have for right now, thank you. All right, so let's talk about defining trust. So Stephen M. R. Covey has a wonderful book called The Speed of Trust, which we will plug uh, multiple times throughout this presentation. And he talks about trust as being composed of these, these two cores, the core of co character and competence. And so the, the core, we're gonna start with competence and look at it and go, the core of competence, right, talks about how capable you are, your talents, your attitude, what skills you have, what knowledge you possess, your past, current, and future performance all lump into what is your competency. And then we have character. Character 
is about your integrity. It's about your intent. It's about your motives and agendas, how you behave, and the humility that you bring to the things, the courage that you bring to things. And how congruent a life do you lead? Um, be shocked the number of people for whom congruence is a really hard concept because they have work them and life them. And those two things aren't the same person. And I very much believe you have to be one whole person, right? This is the reason why, you know, I always include my geeky stuff in my in introductory bio because that's who I am. I, I, I'm a big geek, right? I, I, absolutely also happen to be a leader inside my organization. But to me, recognizing both sides of that is very important to talking about living as a con living a congruent life. Now, I got some news for you. If you're serving as a team leader, what got you here is everything in the competence area. That's what got you here. That's what it got you promoted into that position. It was how capable you were, how knowledgeable you were, how talented you were that got you that promotion in all likelihood. Now, if you've moved, if you're in a point in your career where you've, you're no longer just at that first team leadership, but you're starting to move up in the organization, this may be less directly true for you. I'm specifically talking in this moment to people who are getting that first step into team leadership and are making that transition or looking to make that transition. Your ability to do what you do for your day job, that is what got you into this position and that is your competence. And I'm also here to tell you the sad news that if you lose that opportunity, it is almost certainly because of the character side of the equation. It will, that will be how you will wind up losing things. Now, why? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, there is a, a, a explanation to this in the world of uh, management and leadership. That is our dear friend, the Peter Principle. The concept that pe people in a hierarchy tend to rise to the level of their incompetence, quote unquote, that it is you are promoted based on your success at your previous position. Every time you get a promotion, you are essentially in a new position that you actually don't know how to do right now. And everybody who arrives in a position is like, oh, well, it must be that they want me to continue to do all the things I, were pre I was previously doing. And when you are still in that sort of individual contributor role and you are moving up through, the, through an organization going from developer to developer two to developer three type of climbing up through those ranks, that largely may, remains true. But once you take that first step into leadership, that is the spotlight of truth coming down on the character side of your interactions with your, uh, with your fellow teammates and your fellow employees. And if that side is not been advancing in lockstep in, of skill with your actual skills it, to do your job, then when you step into that team leadership position, that's gonna become very obvious. So we want to make sure that as we go through things, and we're going, you'll hear me talk about this several times throughout the rest of this talk, it has to start with you. It starts with the mirror, making sure that your intent, your motive behind any interaction with someone else that you are dealing with in it from a leadership perspective is correctly and in check and that you're approaching it properly, not to humiliate, not to denigrate, not to uh, to make somebody feel bad just because that's going to make you feel powerful. You need to be trying to approach it from the point of let me help build this person up, even if the the conflict is uh, that has come up is because of the fact that they need to grow. You need to approach it with humility because there are very few people who like to have their weaknesses pointed out and you're going to have to be aware of that as you have those conversations so let's talk about building trust do we have any questions michael yes we do tim uh the first question we have is 
most leadership books do hint towards trust. So how does one go about building trust in a team, especially as a consultant? Okay, it, it's great question. And I'm going to simply say, let's talk about that in the coming section, because that's exactly what we're about to talk about is the action of, of building trust. And if you have a more concrete question after this, this upcoming section, please ask it again, because I think we're about to answer that question in full. Were there any other questions? Yeah, Gerald would like to know if there are any books, articles, or TED Talks you would recommend on developing these leadership qualities. Yeah, so I'm a big fan of two books that I have plugs for at the end, but I'll pre-plug now. Uh, those being Stephen Covey's The Speed of Trust. I would strongly recommend that one. Um, and then also another book that I'm a very big fan of is uh, called uh, The Power of Ted. And we'll talk a little bit about the content in that uh, in that book, but I would recommend both of those and have uh, their covers and uh, author information at the end of this talk. So look forward to that as we go through this. All right, thank you, Tim. Let's go. All right, so let's go into building trust. So in Covey's Speed of the Trust in Speed of Trust book, he talks about. 13 different behaviors that are responsible for building trust. Things that you can concretely do that take trust from the abstract to the actionable. Now, in this talk today, I can't go through all 13. That's just not reasonable. I want to highlight one of them because to me, it is a, it is a major linchpin. And this is Covey's definition of his, his uh, concept of and behavior called practicing accountability. So several things in this definition that I want to highlight, and I'm not just gonna read it to you, but this, it starts with you. It starts with you believing and holding yourself accountable at, at the outset. If you're not holding yourself accountable, that's going to show to everyone around you. If you are always willing to give yourself the benefit of the doubt, and no one else the benefit of the doubt, that's going to tell and it's not going to be a very positive trait. I have, uh, uh, my manager at Improving has a wonderful phrase that he has used with me on multiple times, which is that we have the tendency to judge others by their actions and ourselves by our intent. Well, I intended to do that. That's good enough for me. But I intended to do that is not good enough for other people. And this is here in practice accountability. This is Covey calling to the fact that we should hold ourselves accountable to our actions. And simply having intended to do a thing is not good enough. We should also have the, the taking responsibility for results, good or bad. Um, this, is, this is one which comes up all the time. Uh, I have had conversations, I will have conversations where I had to just look at my manager or to someone I work with side by side and go, I completely messed that up. That's on me. I apologize. Let me, uh, let's have a conversation about how I can make this right. Okay. Clearly communicate. Don't avoid or shirk responsibility. If you're put in the situation where it was your bad, if, if it was something that you did that went astray, just own up to it. Just say, yes, this was because of something I did. I apologize, let's work to make it better. And don't blame or point fingers. This is a horrible, horrible trait in a leader that you should not be trying to say, this is someone's fault. This is, this, is, uh, this is your fault. This should be instead a, we need to work on this. This is an opportunity to turn it back to the collective and go, how do we get past this at this point? Who, uh, who did a particular action that got us there from is rarely worth pointing out. Almost everybody knows. And it's just about how do we get past it at this point? Now, I want to talk about some negative examples of leadership. Um, if you've ever watched the magnificent movie Office Space, you will be familiar with, with this gentleman 
and his TPS reports. There, in his interactions, there are several things that come out of of that when he is interacting with other uh, other people he is managing or lead, attempting to lead. Um, those being, he's not living a congruent, uh, well-intentioned life. He is asking people to stay late, to work hard, all while not doing the same thing himself. It's not, hey, we need some extra time on this. Can everybody be in here on a Saturday with me and we're going to pull this across? It's, yeah, I'm going to need you to work Saturday. And you get the distinct impression he's going to be on his boat while, it, while the workers are in uh, slaving away. The, and then the micromanagement of, let me ask you about this task again and a task again and remind you of every time you've screwed up by going, you really need to include the TPS, the cover letter on that TPS report. This is not the manager you want to be. But this one's easy. Nobody looked at this scene and said, oh, well, obviously I want to be him. No, no, no. On the other hand, the other negative example people look at and all the time and say, I want to be that. And that is Superman. If you look at Superman as leader of a, of a team or leader of a group, there are some major negative examples here. The, Superman is constantly protecting his team from any ne negative repercussions from absolutely anything they might have done wrong. To the point that there is a regular team member of, of uh, Superman who has a habit of stepping off of buildings and just plummeting to the ground. This, this teammate cannot fly, and yet... Superman is always there to save Lois, to stop her from facing the consequences of stepping off of buildings and getting hurt because of it. The You may go, well, I don't want people to get hurt, right? But this is where accountability comes in. It's like, at what point are they going to learn that stepping off buildings is bad if, they are, if there is never accountability for the action of stepping off of a building? This, this behavior that we'll go into later as being a rescuer behavior is super dangerous. We need to not constantly be in the rescuer mode. Now, what we need to do instead, we'll cover later, is, is how do we not just let Lois die, <laughs> but instead uh, to find a way to help Lois realize that this isn't such a great idea. So this, this diagram of a sports team and how a coach would step in and lay out a plan. This is a great example. A coach is rarely on the field with his team during a game. Instead, he's laid out a plan. He is said, here's how I think we should accomplish this. He's provided his best insight and then has to be willing to take a step back and go, but I have to trust that when the reality of the situation does not match my plan, that you, all of you, the players on the field, are smart enough and competent enough to adjust the plan to the actual situation in front of you. Now, I've had a, a structure that I've used to talk about this for several years, and it's been renamed recently, but it talks about accountability. And so I want to walk through this, this hierarchy. As we mentioned, sort of even in Covey's definition, accountability starts with your personal character and competence. It starts with you and a mirror and making sure that you're leading uh, from a correct place in how you're approaching things. Your internal state is, is where it needs to be. The great leaders are accountable uh, f uh, externally for their team. They will stand as the shield and the buffer to their team from outsiders going, nope, if you have a problem with the team, tell me, I'll, I'll take it. I, my team does not need the dressing down. You can dress me down. I, I will take that. It will get back to them. But likewise, bad leaders don't hold their teams accountable internally. If they just take that 
uh, external onslaught and it never gets reflected back in, if it never becomes feedback for the team to learn and grow, then you're not doing your job. Now you're acting more like Superman. You're trying to protect without having any accountability whatsoever. So this is the base of a pyramid of, uh, of accountability. Now, at the next level, it's accountability of others, right? So how, the, the other, other people's characters and competence, okay? This is where we are hoping that people live into that that statement from Star Trek of the good of the one outweighs the, the good of the few or the one, right? These are tough conversations to have to say, I really need you personally to grow, but you need to be able to have these conversations and they need to not all be, or you're done or you're out or so on. You need to leave room for personal growth. We all have bad weeks. And if your only uh, button that you can push is or you're, or you're done, then that really is not going to be very effective uh, in motivating your team. Pardon me. The, uh, so we first have at the base level of this pyramid our personal competence. Now we've written, risen to the character and competence of individuals around you, of other people around you. Now we talk about the character and competence and the capabilities of a group of individuals, the team as a whole. And it's greater than the individual contributors. And there are many great tools that go in that can be discussed to go into building great teams and sort of how and why you do that. And I'm sure in the fullness of time, we'll have lunch and learns all about building great teams and the interpersonal dynamics there. But this is when a group of people are accountable or a group of people have had a shortcoming, that's what this team's level is about. Now, above that, we arrive at the concept of process level problems inside of an organization where we've established that there is a way that this should be done. It's prescriptive. It has, it has guidance. It doesn't matter if this process is, is simply the Scrum framework or if it's Kanban or if it's a release management plan. All of these are possible examples of process, but it's to guide teams and people towards value. It's trying to make sure that we have documented a way that we believe is very good at consistently producing value. And finally, at the top of this pyramid, we have technology. We have this concept of a, a system, the actual hardware and software system that is capable of helping make sure we get things done. And this is the smallest portion of the pyramid. This, the success of organizations, the success of teams, honestly rarely has to do with just the purely technology technology portions of this now here is where i find this hierarchy to be useful many leaders many organizations believe that if a problem exists at a particular level that it can be solved at that level or above that inside the organization so let me give an example. We had a team who had a release planned and the release did, was not successful. Uh, we had to roll back the release. So we have a problem and we're trying to determine how can we fix this problem in the future? The belief of, oh, well, clearly what we need to do now is uh, create a better process, right? Um, that process is not actually going to solve anything. I'd wager that the majorly important parts of that process had already been documented. Instead, we need to realize that this belief that you can move up to solve things isn't the right direction to be moving. We need to reverse that and realize that if we have a problem at a given level of this pyramid, the real solution, 
the long-term solution to that problem exists only at that level or below it inside the pyramid. So if we have a, again, a problem with deploying code and uh, someone deployed the wrong code, okay, so now that problem exists at the others level because of the fact that that was being done by someone in particular, then we need to solve that either by teaching them how to be better at that job, right? To make sure that we raise their competence at that, at that task. So that's solving it at the other's level. Or we need to realize that we maybe never should have given that task to them at all, which starts, which means that you as a leader in the organization were, was where the problem actually resided, that they shouldn't have had that task to begin with, which means it's a personal, or it is quite probable that the answer is both. We need to both help someone grow and realize that right now, they're not the right person to actually dig us out of the moment that we're in at this time. So this hierarchy is a tool and it's a useful one to go, to, to pause before you snap react in a situation, just sort of go through in your mind. It's like, all right, what did we have as a failing here? What is What was the actual failing? If we had, and push as low in the tree as you possibly can, it is easy to go, oh, we were deploying code. Well, it wasn't one person's code. It was probably like the team's code. So we could go, oh, so the team has a problem. Mm, but was the team hands on keyboard? Is the team the actual root cause here? Maybe, maybe not. And so once you answer the, answer that question, you find that lowest level, then you know, I need to look for solutions at this level or below in this hierarchy. Now, sometimes when I present this, people will come to me and go, but Tim, we need to make our processes better. And I would, I would point you to Covey again and several others, right? Which is, if you are constantly adding to process, if you are constantly doing uh, things uh, things that are trying to document your way out of situations, you're actually doing a thing which is you're lowering trust. You are, the higher trust is in your organization, the higher I can trust my teams to go and be successful at what they're doing, then the faster and better an organization will go. In almost every process, almost every process is friction inside an organization. It's a friction to that organization working perfectly. Now it's a balancing act, to be clear. I'm not saying have no process. You have to have just enough process to make sure you have your legal basis covered, that you are, you are being clear about your expectations, but then you also need to trust. If I have a team who's going to deploy software and they had a rigorous uh, plan for how they were gonna deploy, and someone realized along the way, well, I was told to modify this file in, in Notepad++, but it didn't tell me to save that file before I closed Notepad, so I'm not gonna save because it didn't tell me to save. That's process as a crutch, that's breaking trust. That's not those people feeling empowered and that they are trusted to get the job done. Now you just have people who are lockstep running a pro finite list of tasks that you've given them. Those uh, done well inside of organizations, things that run finite repeatable tasks are called computers, not people. And if you have deployments to the point where they're just turnkey and you can turn them over to computers, fantastic. But if you have a human involved, I want a human to use all of their capabilities, their mind and uh, ingenuity to make sure that we're successful, whether or not it is in perfect alignment with the process. So when I start with a new team, this is a slide I use uh, when I meet with them. I have had the opportunity just in the last couple of weeks to start as the leader of a team with one of our clients. And I did at the time use this slide to talk to my team about these are what I expect from uh, from teams. This is me talking about uh, about what I expect of them at the outset. I want them to know that they're empowered. I want to, them to know that you know they are 
empowered to go and make any change that they want. I'm often talking with development teams because of my personal background and skill. And so my example of you have commit rights and the delete key and you shouldn't be afraid to use them. That's somewhat crazy to a lot of developers. I've had more than one tell me, you don't actually mean that, right? You don't mean I can just go and willy nilly uh, delete or change anything that I want. And I will look at them and go, I absolutely do mean that. And that I have systems and technology like source control that if I disagree with a change you've made, I'll roll it back. But I believe that nothing speaks better than code. And if you've got an, an, an argument to make, if you believe that you can uh, make the system better, you're empowered to do so and you should go do so. I believe the team should be learning environments, right? That That everyone is learning every single day. That just because you did something and then we undo it. That's not a judgment on you. That's you learning, which is great. We, we're now all better because you're better. And so this learning environment is one that I want the team to hear me at the outset that I'm invested in. And then I want them to know that they are trusted, right? That runs through everything above. You're trusted. If you weren't trusted, you wouldn't be here. This is, we. you are empowered and you're learning because we trust you to do the right thing. Now, these are my rules th that I ex give to teams. You can have your own, but I use this to try to set the tone. Now, when I sit, tell most of the people that I work with that they're trusted, they know in their heart, because of the fact that they understand what trust means, that that means that they're also accountable, right? There is accountability throughout the entirety of the description of what I've laid out here, but I've never had to use that word. I have tried instead to make a to lean into a positive feeling where we're explaining that I am turning over to the team so much capability, the empowerment to go do what they need to, to learn what they need to, to accomplish what they need to. So. This is a tool I have used to help set expectations as we start out with a new team. I would encourage you to think about this sort of sort of message. Um, very few leaders have ever had this conversation that directly with teams, and I think it's super important to be able to 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 state it explicitly that this is what we expect. Hearing this from leaders is so empowering to teams. It's so inspiring to teams. And you, you, will, you might feel a little hokey the first time that you do this, but trust me, it will bear fruit. Okay, so the other thing we wanna talk about in building trust is, is one of mindsets and how humans react to this. Um, and so uh, we're going to not spend a, time, a bunch of time on this. I could do an, multi-hour talk just on these next two slides if I wanted to. But in his book, The Power of Ted, uh, David Emerald talk, uh, lays out a concept he calls the dreaded drama triangle. And it's how humans are going to uh, generally react. And if put into a situation, you're going to see one of three behaviors likely become their, their reaction to a stressful situation. Those reactions will either be to believe that they are a victim, that the world is doing something to them, that you are doing something to them, but it, but importantly, that the blame is external to them. The uh, they might become the rescuer and sweep in, uh, taking the challenge off of the individual who was going to be accountable and attempt to uh, sweep that aside, denying the person who's in the situation the opportunity to learn or grow from this. Um, several people will go, rescuer isn't bad. And I'll, I'll say, no, 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 rescuer is bad because if you give a man a fish, you have fed him for a day. If you teach a man to fish, you have fed him for a lifetime. Rescuers constantly give fish. They never teach to fish. And finally, we have the, uh, the persecutor, this mindset of, oh, I'm under stress, so I'm going to attack back. I'm going to, to jump in. This is the fight side of fight or flight. And this is uh, definitely one of those moments, regardless of what 
type of form that fighting takes, it is definitely a reaction that human beings have in the situation of a, of, of a stressful situation. And so then we turn that around and uh, we talk about the empowerment dynamic, this concept of there are positive variations to each of these that we need to consider and help as leaders, as we put, have conversations that are critical conversations, that are stressful conversations for those that we are working with, we want to help them move from that initial dramatic response into a positive side uh, equivalent. So the victim mindset, we help them realize that this isn't being done to them and that they can create a better future for them right they they are capable of creating a better way for this to this to result in the future if they they lean into that so we help victims move to the concept of being those empowered to create their own future we help rescuers become coaches we tell people this is stop giving out fish right start teaching people how to fish and we recognize that the, the persecutor actually wants to see change, which is good. He's just going about it the wrong way. And instead, we are going to challenge them to become challengers who are going to ask hard questions that will prompt action and promote accountability within the team. It is amazing how easy it can be but difficult to master to go and say wait i was just about to get mad and instead i'm going to pause and i'm going to ask the one right question in this situation sometimes all it takes is the one right challenging question that doesn't have an easy easy answer but will bring into frame and focus the the situation that we're in all right so before we go into putting this into practice, let's pause and see if we have some questions, because I'm willing to bet there were some questions out of that section. Hey, Tim, you have questions flooding in here, so I'm going to try and give you a couple. Yeah. Uh, the first one is, <clears throat> on accountability being a core concept to leadership, how do you navigate keeping people accountable when you're an informal leader without coming across as tattling to someone in a management position? So that's great. So the the informal leadership is uh, and addressing accountability is to, I would say, keep the formal leaders out of it if you can. OK, start with person to person accountability, right? Go to that other person and go, hey, I just noticed this. And I really don't feel like that was our best possible outcome. I think we've dropped the ball on accountability there. Can I help you uh, get better at this? Is there something that's challenging you that's making this difficult for you to hold, uh, hold to and keep accountability on this? But have that conversation away from everyone else as a one-on-one -on -one conversation. The one-on-one -on -one private conversation is the, the uh, uh, intercontinental ballistic missile of, of informal leadership. You would be, you can change the world through private informal conversations where you approach it with the right heart and it's not blame. It's about, let me help you get better at this. Or I saw this and I'm concerned. Is there something, I, is something going on that I need to be aware of? Those really simple conversations are, are the place to start. Now, if it becomes a consistent pattern and you've tried the informal conversation and it's not prompting the, the change you want to see, then at that point you need to talk to the formal leaders because they, they may not have the visibility you do as a teammate and you owe it to them to then raise it up. But start with it being a person-to-person -person conversation because that's what you owe the person who you want to be more accountable first. Thank you, Tim. <clears throat> I think the next question I have here is uh, back to your hierarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, it resembled the concept of defensive management uh, in people where it is very easy to tend towards higher levels 
Uh, what triggers and flags do you look for to identify if you have a true need to go lower on the hierarchy versus an appropriate higher level solution? I, I think that when, when we're going lower, it really becomes what is the right place to fix it. And like I said, often the answer is multiple, uh, multiple times. This, this is a little bit of a, a learned skill, right? Is to, to start looking and go, the easiest answer is always to go, this is solved right here, right now. Um, that, that, you know, if it was a problem with a particular individual, so it's at that other's level, I'm going to solve it at the other's level, right? But then there are times when that isn't the right answer because of the constraints you're under. Um, as an example, if you have a system that will just crash after it's been live for 48 hours, but redeployment right now because you're a tax accounting software and it's April 13th is just not a thing you can find acceptable, right? It's You're in a critical business time. You aren't willing to take the risk of what a redeployment right now would mean. Then you might solve that technology problem by coming all the way down to either others or self and simply say, I'm going to be up at midnight and reboot the servers when nobody's using them. Because of the fact that if I reboot, the system will be fine for another uh, another two days and we can get past it. That that sort of thing is about learning these interactions, looking at the constraints you're under at the time and, and finding that best answer. Unfortunately, I don't have really solid guidance about making uh, how to make those calls without it being concrete and in the moment. Thank you, Tim. Another question I have is, are you a fan of radical candor? I, I am a fairly big fan of, of candor as long as it is appropriately compassionate. And so I, I think that uh, the concept of always being uh, perfectly high candor can be the wrong answer if it's going to put people in the wrong mindset. I have people who I know if I just come at them with pure radical candor, that is every single time going to put them in a victim mentality. And if I know that that is how that person reacts, then that may not be my best approach. It is, uh, I have to make sure that all of the right information is displayed, that I need to make sure that there it's clear that action needs to be taken. But sometimes purely that pure radical truth, hard truth moment is not the right answer is not the right answer because it's going to prompt the wrong reaction in the person that you're working with. Thank you, Tim. I have a number of questions related to putting this in practice, so I think it's a good time to move on. Okay. So in the next section, we're going to just go through some a couple of short examples here of how do we how do we put in this into practice and some uh, some concretes. And in this section, I, I just always feel bad when I'm doing, you know, these role play things. I want to give a name to someone and, you know, that person is going to be put in a negative light. And if I choose, uh, choose a name and then the person will be like, well, you talked bad about me in my presentation. No, I just happened to use your first name. I'm sorry. So in this case, I have sided with the, all the negative examples in this are me. So with that said, what if we were on a team and I have a situation where I don't know what Tim is doing? Despite being at stand-up every day, he's vague. He's not making it clear what he's working on. And I have no idea if that task is ever going to get done, what he did yesterday, what he's planning to do today. And he's just softly talking to it. Or I'm working on tasks related to something Bob and Phil are working on. But, you know, and I'm helping them out. And it's like, okay, we this is something we can observe, right? We can see see. This this is what is going on. These are the facts of the moment. Now, let's start orienting this to what are we seeing? I would suspect Tim is obfuscating because of the fact that he's in some form of victim mindset where he doesn't feel comfortable with his task or he feels over his head and he's not comfortable at exposing that vulnerability and being that vulnerable to the to the rest of the team. So we probably have an others problem. And so if we have an others level problem, we need to start 
looking at solutions for this at either the others level or the self level, right? So then how are we gonna decide and act on this? What, what are we going to do here, right? And the, uh, I, we could talk to Tim privately in formal conversations, the, the, that intercontinental ballistic missile of informal leadership. So you could do this even if you're not the scrum master, right? And say, ask if he's having a problem and truly listen in that moment, right? Don't come in prejudging the situation, just ask. Are you having challenges? Is there something I could do to help? And then we could also change how we run the standup. We could have everyone touch the task that they are specifically working on. This is a tool I've used multiple times when people don't want to talk to a specific story or a specific thing that they're doing. I'm like, walk up and touch, physically touch the task on the task board that you are working on at the, at the current time. And if you're working on multiple for, each thing that you're doing, touch it until you're now talking about something else and then touch about touch the other thing. By the way, if they touch more than one thing on a regular basis, that's a smell in and of itself in Scrum. So this is an example of how to how to look at a situation to we we went from observing a problem to sort of orienting ourselves to how we wanted to solve that problem, and then making a decision and acting on on that decision. This is another one that happens uh, from time to time, which is Tim gets upset when you critique his code or critique his work. Um, this used to be far more common. I, am, I, I have given this talk for, I, I discovered the other day when I pulled these slides up, I've been giving this talk for uh, going on seven years now. And uh, seven years ago, it was remarkably more common for code reviews to be done in big rooms where everyone sat around and the code was put up on the projection and we walked through it line by line. And that is one of the most humiliating things a human being will ever be put through and is just asking for negative reactions. And so when we get put into this situation, it might appear like we have an other situation. It is Tim who's getting upset, but I think what we actually have here is a, a self problem, right? Sitting in a room with the code up on a big wall and saying, we're doing a, this big public code re review, it's fairly well bound to create a negative response. It's gonna put people straight into somewhere on the triangle. They're either just gonna get quiet and, and just take it and walk away later and fix it, but they're not very happy about the outcome. There's, there's the victim mindset, right? They're, they're going to, to sit there and go, just go, oh, I don't know how to fix it until somebody else goes, well, I'll, I'll jump in there and fix that for you. There's rescuer at play, right? Or they're going to get upset and you're going to have that outburst or that, that uh, you know, well, it's not like you're, you know, you've written any better code than this. Those sorts of sort of snap biting remarks are, are the response of the persecutor mindset coming through. And so going back to the hierarchy on accountability, I really think that this comes down to looking at the mirror and going, would I want to be in this situation? Would I enjoy what I'm asking my team to go through? And the answer is no, I don't think very many people would. And I think this is likely a self-issue instead. And so then that moves to a, how do we decide and act, which is to come in and say, we need to change this up and move to asynchronous feedback, like pull requests where it's not in the moment, there's not the social pressure, things like that. All right, we are nearly out of time. Uh, so do we have maybe one more question, Michael? Yeah, I do have one more interesting question. Um, is changing how we run standup not a process level change? Is that not going higher in the hierarchy? Changing how I work the the particulars of standup does not change what standup is attempting to accomplish. So I would say that when you're talking about someone putting their finger on the task, it's not changing what you're expecting out of standup. So I don't think that that's moving up higher in the chain. I'm also not saying that all standups need to do this from now on. 
which is one of those indications to me of process level change. Process level change is sweeping. It's it's going to be a change that we stick with forever versus something that we're going to do for the next week while we make sure that people get into habits of more directly talking to what they're uh, they're talking about. All right. So very quickly. Here is the reading list out of this talk, the, uh, the Power of Ted by David Emerald and Stephen M. R. Covey's The Speed of Trust. We've talked about content from both of these books, and if you're looking for something that's great to read, I would recommend that you go check these out. Um, we're out of questions, but I will quickly mention that Ty Crockett will be back here on Friday to talk about doing remote scrum mastery. So in this time where too many people are working remote, if you're having challenges with scrum teams in that situation and how to lead teams that way, Ty is going to be a great talk and you should check it out this Friday. Likewise, next Wednesday, we're going to have uh, Daniel coming in and talking about running, uh, designing and running effective meetings uh, remotely. And so I hope that you look forward to joining us at those times and I hope you will join us. If you're looking for any of our events, they're available right here on uh, with calendars and recordings of the previous sessions, including this one early next week. I thank you again for all your time and uh, look forward to seeing you again.